Okay, so this is going to be a potentially long video on rotational energy, specifically rotational kinetic energy, and how that plays in with the others. We're going to look at the concept, um, the formula, and then we're going to go through quite an extended example, which uh, might just blow your mind. We'll see, we'll see. Okay, so for, for, to start with the concept, um, energy uh, um, can be stored in rotation. So if you have like a spinning disc, um, such as what we call a flywheel, Okay, spins about a particular radius. There is rotational uh, energy, we call it rotational kinetic energy, in that moving disc. And it has to come from somewhere. So our conservation laws still hold true, so it has to come from somewhere and go to somewhere. So if you spin up the disc, it has to come from whatever's spinning up the disc. And if it goes away, um, it has to go to something. Um, and an example in a car, when you change gears, we push on the clutch. This is a manual car, um, stick shift, if you're used to that um, and when you put in the clutch um, you, you're, you're um, letting the flywheel spin to retain the energy you change the gear and then you release the clutch and that spinning disc um, there's a plate which comes into contact with that and all of the uh, energy is um, probably a little bit of energy loss but that energy is reused again um, to, to get it spinning um, at a faster speed than it would if it was starting from still again. Anyway, so that's a concept. You can store energy and release it. Um, uh, it's rotational kinetic energy. Okay, same way you have linear kinetic energy, but this time it's rotational. So the formula, uh, unsurprisingly, for normal linear kinetic energy, um, ek lin, um, it's hard to draw fine on this, is half mv squared. So ek rotational is going to be half i, the inertia, omega, the angular velocity, squared. So exactly the same formula, just with rotational uh, terms used. Okay, now we get on to the big tricky example. And uh, I'll just set up this example here. We'll, we'll give ourselves a little bit of space first, because this is going to this is going to be extended. Um, so here is a, a slope. Um, I'll, I'll try and make it a little bit 3D so it's a bit easier to see and we're going to have uh, three different size spheres, solid spheres um, solid spheres and they're set at a particular height so they have particular gravitational potential energy um, MGH they don't have to be the same masses but they're all solid spheres so their mass distribution is the same Okay, and what we're going to do is uh, let go of them, release them at the same time, and we want to know which one reaches the bottom first. Okay, so have a little think about that. Which one is going to reach the bottom first? Uh, the largest one, the middle one, or the small one? Okay, so hopefully you've got a bit of an idea. Here's a way that we can work it out. We're dealing with energy. Let's, let's um, use energy to help us. So at the top, the total energy is... is uh, um, gravitational potential energy so that's the top and then um, at any stage throughout um, there will be rotational kinetic energy um, plus linear kinetic energy okay and and plus a little bit of um, uh, gravitational potential energy according to the height so we'll, we'll just call this at the bottom then because then all of that gravitational potential energy is converted to uh, rotational and linear kinetic energy. Um, so we can write E K rot rotation plus E K linear. Okay, I'm sorry my K's are hard to draw on this because the resolution is not that great on my screen. Anyway, um, so how does this uh, affect things? Well, each of these solid spheres has to spin up has to um, increase in, in rotational speed before it gets down there. Um, we, if we're talking about the, um, the angular velocity or the, the rotational velocity, um, because the larger ball has a larger radius, it's going to have a lower angular velocity, but it's also true that it's going to have a larger mass, so it'll have a larger inertia. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of tricky things going on here, but... Um, yeah, we. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ramble if I don't follow some notes. I've wrote some notes down to follow here because this is quite tricky and quite involved. But the main thing is that we stick with this equation to consider it. 
So usually if you're dropping masses vertically, if you were just dropping these vertically straight down, boom, 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 doesn't matter what the mass is. So we might um, write that in a, in a formula for um, for just vertical uh, a vertical drop. The the mass does not is not proportional to the acceleration. Okay, because we know that um, from f equals m a you have um, a uh, a force that's proportional to the mass leading to the same acceleration due to gravity. Okay. Um, so acceleration downwards due to gravity. That's a common misconception. People still mark that one up and still think that um, heavier things will fall at a, a greater acceleration, but they don't. Anyway, so the same thing is true here. The mass does not affect um, the rate of acceleration down the ramp. Okay, so mass does not affect the rate of acceleration, but as we've seen, um, a greater mass distribution. So if your mass is at a greater radius, so the mass is at a greater radius, then um, that will uh, have a a greater inertia, okay, and therefore a lower rotational um, velocity, lower angular velocity. So um, that's for a mass at a greater radius. So the large ball will will, and this makes sense. If you try this yourself, get a tennis ball and a basketball, and just um, roll them at the same, or no, no, let them roll down a, a slope. You'll see that the tennis ball, being a smaller radius, will spin up faster. And the basketball um, with a greater radius will spin up slower. Okay, they're both hollow spheres. These are not hollow spheres for this example. If you can get some ball bearings or marbles of similar sizes and give it a go yourself, you'll be able to see this. This is quite cool. Um, so uh, what we would find in this case uh, is that the objects with the um, greatest mass distribution um, would... Oh, okay, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. These are all solid spheres, so they all have the same mass distribution. Not the same inertia, okay, but they have the same mass distribution. Okay, that's really crucial. So they will all hit the bottom at the same time. It seems a little bit strange, but they will. And how that works is the larger one will have a greater proportion of... Um, Hang on, no, this is this is incorrect. They'll have the same rotational kinetic energy, as I said before, because um, the angular velocity um, is inversely proportional to the inertia, well, with that squared factor as well. So if you increase the inertia, your angular velocity will change uh, um, accordingly. Um, and uh, your, your middle size has got a, a balanced version of the two. This one down here will have a higher... Um, angular velocity and lower inertia overall, but because they've got the same mass distribution, the proportion of rotational kinetic energy each of them has is the same. Okay, so the linear kinetic energy therefore has to be the same. Okay, if the, if the linear kinetic energy is the same, they'll reach the bottom at the same time because linear kinetic energy um, gives that velocity, that crucial bit, the half mv squared. If you rearrange, hang on, that means. They might not have the same linear kinetic energy, but they will have the same linear velocity. Okay, because their masses are going to be different, even though their their mass distribution is the same. You've got to muck through this. Honestly, it took my class. Um, we went through this for about an hour or so, and then the next lesson we we, we revised it again, um, and over another half an hour. And you really need to experiment with it, come up with a chain of kind of cause and effect which um, uh, leads to this effect, leads to this effect of them being the same speed down there. Now if we have a second example it might become a little bit more clearer. So this is, this is where it becomes um, a little bit clearer. Where's this? We're going we're gonna to shift to uh, a slope again, but this time we're going to have our solid sphere. We're going to have a, um, a, a solid um, disc or a tube. Okay, and then we're going to have a hollow, hollow tube. Okay, all with the same mass. So this is this kind of makes it. They're all the same mass, but they're different. Clearly, different um, mass distribution, um, which also means different inertia. But remember, inertia is different from mass distribution. Things can have different inertias, but the same mass distribution as we saw with those spheres. So different inertia, uh, inertia, uh, and different mass distribution. Okay, so the one that has all of the mass 
concentrated to the outside is going to have the greatest inertia if the mass is the same. So the inertia is going to be the greatest. This one, the inertia is sort of the middle, and this has the smallest inertia because the greatest amount of mass closer to the center. If we use our formula again um, for the um, to find the kinetic energy at the bottom, um, so EP uh, grav is going to be equal EK rotational plus EK linear, and whichever one has the greatest linear um, kinetic energy for the same mass all around is going to have the greatest velocity and is going to reach the bottom first. So for which one is going to have the greatest rotational um, kinetic energy, um, it's, it's got, going to be the um, one with the greatest inertia um, because, uh, well it does, let's look at the formula for it, it's half i omega squared Okay, and I guess you could um, give these the same radius as well, same mass distribution, same mass, same radius, different mass distribution. All these things are very slightly different, aren't they? So, um, so whichever one has the highest um, inertia um, is going to have the highest kinetic uh, rotational kinetic energy. Whichever one has the lowest inertia is going to have the highest standard kinetic energy, linear kinetic energy, which is going to be the ball. So the ball is going to accelerate down fastest, uh, and the last one to reach the bottom will be the uh, solid um, hollow sphere, sorry, the hollow sphere, with all the mass concentrated at the outside. So it's going to, if you think of it another way, the more mass further away from the center, the longer it takes to spin up. Um, it's just harder to do that. Okay, this has gone on way too long. Um, you're going to have to go back and play the video through again. Read your textbook. Talk to your physics teacher. Experiment. Really important. Get some uh, uh, marbles. and um, Don't lose your marbles, but get some marbles and have a go at this example here. I think, I think this one is the crucial example. Find different size, maybe ball bearings, so the different masses compared to the different marbles, and roll them down and, and watch it and verify for yourself. Watch out if they track all over the place, because that's going to cover a greater distance. Um, if you can get them to go down a groove in a ruler perhaps, um, or between two rulers, um, but just be careful that the effects of friction are not going to stuff it up because it um, should be minimal friction if you can get a single point on each of these because there's a single point right at the bottom of a sphere in contact, so the surface area in contact should be the same. Uh, and if you roll them down, if you can get them rolling straight down the slope, side by side, you'll be able to see, and you can watch the linear um, velocity being the same, but the angular velocity being different with the smallest one having the greatest one. And those are some clues and some keys to help you step this through in your mind. It's really, really worth um, taking the time to experiment with this. Okay, there we go.